hello truth seekers in this video i will discuss the mysterious and popular story of jesus his life lazy and more there seems to be something incorrect about his story especially when comparing it to the stories of the book of enoch and historical records according to the bible jesus and mary took a sabbatical alone it is worth noting that mary and joseph had several other kids but only the male children are mentioned by name it was even revealed in a prophetical text such as the history of Joseph the carpenter, suggesting that Joseph was a widower many times over, very suspect, with children from previous marriages before he married Mary, making me question Joseph's obedience and loyalty image. However, the omission of women in the stories raise questions, especially when we see that the Book of Enoch initially discusses the great and magical deeds of goddess Isis. Still, then the story shifts to focus solely on men. Even when looking at historical evidence such as ancient wall carvings, women seem to be praised more than men, which leads me to the question the completeness and authenticity of the Book of Enoch. Enoch. The author who's also a man so there's a reason to wonder if he's telling the whole truth i wonder why the history of men often overlook the legacies stories and achievements of women it is a deliberate attempt to erase us from history and prevent us from realizing our inner strength could it be that men throughout history and today are afraid of the power we hold i'm not trying to criticize men but whether to uncover the complete truth without leaving anything out Let's explore that and challenge traditional narratives. And please beware. Please note that this is all alleged. I've never met any of these people. I've deeply researched all of my information. Here we go again. I mean, this is a true show oh, and there's more. Oh, I'm not done yet. Oh, and there's more. Oh, I'm not done yet. I mean, this is a true show. Oh, yes. This is a trigger warning. In this video, I may be talking about or showing sensitive material about some subjects or topics that may be disturbing or upsetting or may bring forth some troubling memories, as you've read in the description or title. With that said, either in the video now or brace yourself. Aside from that, enjoy. Now, for me to better understand and debunk the story of Jesus, I have to figure out why they made it up in the first place. Through extensive research, I have learned that Women and men brains are created differently. Take a look at these clips. Women have much healthier activity in their prefrontal cortex. So the front third of the brain. And the frontal lobe is called the executive part of the brain. It's the CEO, because it's sort of like the boss at work. It helps mm. you with forethought and judgment, impulse control, organization, planning, empathy, learning, from the mistakes you make. And who goes to jail? Males, 14 times more than females because their frontal lobes. Because are we're less able active. to assess a danger or the consequence more than a guy? Yes. That's insane. We are discussing men's brains, women's brains, and how they're very different from each other. Now, I want to start with men's brains. All right, now, men's brains. Are, are very unique. Men's brains are made up of little boxes. And we have a box for everything. We've got a box for the car, we've got a box for the money, we've got a box for the job, we've got a box for you, we've got a box for the kids, we've got a box for your mother somewhere in the basement. We got we got we, we got boxes everywhere. A and the rule is the boxes don't touch. <laughs> When a man discusses a particular subject, we go to that particular box, we pull that box out, we open the box, we discuss only what is in that box. All right? And, and, and then we close the box and put it away being very, very careful not to touch any other boxes. <laughs> now women's brains 
are very, very different from men's brains. Women's brains are made up of a big ball of wire. And everything is connected to everything. And the money's connected to the car, and the car's connected to your job, and your kids are connected to your mother, and everything's connected to everything. And it's like... It's like the internet superhighway, okay? And, and it's all driven by energy that we call emotion. It's, just, it's, it's, it's one of the reasons why women tend to remember everything. Because if you take an event and you connect it to an emotion, it burns in your memory and you can remember it forever. The same thing happens for men. It just doesn't happen very often because, quite frankly, we don't care. <laughs> uh, women tend to care about everything. And she just loves it. <laughs> okay? Now men, we have a box in our brain that most women are not aware of. This particular box has nothing in it. In fact, we call it the nothing box. And of all the boxes a man has in his brain, the nothing box is our favorite box. If a man has a chance, he'll go to his nothing box every time. <laughs> That's why a man can do something seemingly completely brain dead for hours on end. You know, like fishing. <laughs> now they've actually measured this. The University of Pennsylvania a couple of years ago did a study and discovered that men have the ability to think about absolutely nothing and still breathe. <laughs> You know, they connected all the wires and stuff like that and watched the brain activity, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> I think he's dead! Huh? <laughs> you know, women can't do it. They can't do it. Their minds never stop. <laughs> and, and they don't understand the nothing box! And it drives them crazy! Because nothing drives a woman more crazy or makes her feel more irritated than to witness a man doing nothing! Do you see a difference between the female brain and the male brain? The mass. And it's like we're not even the same species. Really? It's their brains are so much busier. And generally they're healthier females make good leaders. All of this information makes me question the story of Joseph and Mary, more because it's solely based on obedience and listening to what God had planned for them without any questions asked. The Book of Enoch does not explicitly mention Jesus Christ or Mary by name. However, it does contain references to a figure known as the Son of Man, who is described as a messianic figure, figure destined to bring about a new era of righteousness and judgment. This concept aligns with Jesus' self-identification in the New Testament. But the book of Enoch itself does not directly refer to Jesus. Oh, I'm not done yet. Enoch gets very deep and starts feeling himself. I mean, he was literally becoming very arrogant. Or was he? I mean, look at his descriptions of the Son of Man. In the book of Enoch, particularly in the section known as the Parable of Enoch, 1 Enoch 37 chapters through 71st verse. The Son of Man is allegedly a significant messianic figure. Well, that's what we were taught to believe. Now, here are some key points about this figure. The Son of Man is also referred to as the Chosen One, Anointed, and Righteous One. Role and Mission 
This figure is depicted as an astrological hero who will bring about a new era of righteousness and judgment. He is destined to judge the deeds of the wicked and establish a kingdom of peace. Oh yes. Prophetic visions. Enoch is shown visions of this figure who will sit on a throne of glory, destroy sinners and strike down kings and rulers who oppose God. Oh yes. Salvation and worship. He says that the son of man will be a light to the nations and the righteous will find salvation in its name. Mm -hmm. Or did he say in its name? He will be worshipped by all who dwell on the earth. Or did it say it would be worshipped by all who dwell on the earth? It. Not he, but it. Hmm. Put a pin on that, ladies and gentlemen. Enoch's identification. But get this. In 1st Enoch 71st chapter 14 verse, Enoch himself is identified as the son of man figure in a vision which has led to various interpretations and debates among scholars and me. I mean, the portrayal of the son of man in the book of Enoch was later influenced and copied by the modern Jews and Christians, as we see in the New Testament, where Jesus often refers to himself as the son of man. You see, the son of man in the book of Enoch and Jesus in the New Testament share some similarities, but there are also key differences. Here's a comparison. Similarities. Messianic role. Both figures are portrayed as messianic destined to bring out a new era of righteousness and judgment. Judgment. Both are depicted as judges who will evaluate the deeds of humanity and bring justice. Titles such as the son of man in Enoch is also called the chosen one, anointed and righteous one which are titles that resonate with descriptions of Jesus. Heavenly origin. Both figures are described as having pre-existence heavenly origins. Oh, mm -hmm. now differences, identity. In the book of Enoch, the son of man is sometimes identified with Enoch himself. Whereas in the New Testament, Jesus is uniquely identified as the son of man. Mm -hmm. Divine status. The New Testament emphasizes Jesus' unique, divine status as the Son of God, whereas the Son of Man in Enoch is more of an exalted human or angelic figure. Salvation. Jesus is portrayed as the Savior of humanity, offering salvation through the death and resurrection. The Son of Man in Enoch is more focused on the judgment and the establishment of a righteous kingdom and the truth. These comparisons highlight how the concept of the Son of Man evolved and was interpreted differently in various texts. The Book of Enoch's portrayal influenced later Jewish and Christian thought, contributing to the development of messianic expectations. The Bible stole aspects of Enoch, but added some enhancements, you see, based on Christ's energy. Not exactly the person. You see, Enoch a figure from the Bible is known for his great faith and close relationship with God. While he is not typically associated with performing miracles in the same way as Jesus, some accounts suggest he had significant spiritual power though. For example, Enoch is said to have led a righteous community and had the ability to communicate directly with God. Hmm. Jesus, on the other hand, is well documented in the New Testament for performance forming numerous miracles such as healing the sick, raising the dead, and turning water into wine. <laughs> yeah. These miracles were central to his ministry and are key aspects of his identity as the Son of God. So while Enoch is revered for his faith and righteousness, his actions are not described in the same miraculous way. This means that Enoch was merely a devoted man to the God he praises. Although he doesn't really say the God he praises, he is often referred to as Yahweh or Jehovah. The God is the creator of the universe, the one true God who is all powerful, all knowing and ever present. In the context of Enoch's story, God is depicted as being who values righteousness, faith and obedience. Key words, righteousness, faith and obedience. Pin that ladies and gentlemen. Who does this sound like? Enlil, 
the Anunnaki brother who loved being praised framed his brother Inky with the name of the devil and Satan because he revealed the truth to the captives of the Garden of Eden about his brother's mischievous godlike complex deeds. Who is the devil in your eyes? Is he also an alien or is it a not a real person, who, not a real spirit? You, Who's the devil? Let me tell you what happened. So if you look, you go again into the ancient tablets, you discover that a Yahweh, who's in the Bible is known as God, right? Yahweh is known in the ancient text as Satan, the Lord of Eden, E-D-I-N. The land between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers is where they had the Eden, E-D-I-N. When he has his outdoor laboratories, what I like to call it, where they discovered that mating these people together would work if they had enough genetic diversity. What happens is his brother, Ea Enki, who's now known as Satan, he comes in and he starts talking to the people there. And he starts telling them, it wasn't just Adam and Eve he was talking to, there were other people there. And he was telling them how powerful they really were. The mysteries of the universe was inside of their body and that they had the ability to ascend even to a higher level than even them. These people then realized that they weren't animals, they clothed themselves. And by the time this Yahweh character, also known as Enlil, comes back, Satan, he realizes what's happened that his brother has given them the apple. What's the apple? Knowledge. And so he gets pissed off. Enoch's relationship with God, characterized by deep faith and a close personal walk with him. Let me say that again. Enoch's relationship with God is characterized by deep faith and close personal walk with him. This God is the same who later reveals himself through the prophets and ultimately through Jesus in the New Testament. Key words, New Testament. Enoch's life of faith and his being taken up to heaven without experiencing death is seen as a testament to his profound connection with God for his obedience. Yeah. Now, from what I gather, Enoch was a faithful, devoted messenger of this unknown God. But get this, God is not what we were all taught. The English, and please, please prepare for the blown away crap that I'm about to tell you right now. The English word God has an interesting etymology. It comes from the old English word God, which itself is derived from the Proto-Germanic Gouda. This term has cognates in other Germanic languages such as gup and gothic good and old Norse and got and old high German. Oh yes. Now the Proto-Germanic term is believed to have originated from the Proto-Indo-European root ga, which means to call or to invoke. This reflects the idea of divine entity being called upon or invoked, which is common theme in many ancient religions. Oh yes. Interestingly, the word God was originally a neutered noun in Germanic languages, but shifted to a masculine man only noun after the spread of Christianity. This shift reflects the influence of Christian theology, which often emphasizes the masculine aspects of God. Oh yes. This means that the word God means to invoke the God for men or goddesses for women. You see, God to invoke God for men and goddesses for women. It means to invoke within you. So when Enoch is saying that he is praising God, he's saying he's praising himself and we are the creators and we control our own destinies. Enoch was devoted to invoking this energy that the church later turned into a person, a man. The killing of Jesus wasn't an actual person. It was the killing of Christ-like energy and the conversion of Christianity. Hence the name Christianity is derived from the word Christian, which itself has roots in ancient languages. Greek origin. The term Christian comes from the Greek word Christianos, which means follower of Christ. The word Christos in Greek means anointed one, which is a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Oh yes. Latin influence. This Greek term was later translated into Latin as Christianus, maintaining the meaning of follower of Christ. Uh-huh. English adaptation. 
over time, Christianus, that's with the U, evolved into Christian in English with an A-N. And the term Christianity was formed to describe the religion based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. The person not teaching of Christ-like energy in which it was originally taught. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, so Christianity originally meant the faith and practices of those who follow Christ-like energy, not the person. Oh, yeah. So, does this mean that Jesus Christ was never a person and that the story of Mary and Jesus was made up? Or was it misinterpreted through translation? To understand this, we have to learn more about God, other names, Jesus, and who we not cause in the book. Okay? Yahweh and Jehovah are two names used to refer to the God of the Israelites in the Hebrew Bible. Here is a bit more about each. Yahweh the origin. The name Yahweh is derived from the Hebrew tetragrammaton YHWH, which consists of the consonants Yad, He, Wa, and He. This name was revealed to Moses in the books of Exodus and Enoch. The exact meaning of Yahweh is debated, but it is often interpreted as he brings into existence whatever exists, or I am who I am. This means, again, the God or goddesses within themselves usage. Over time, the name Yahweh became considered too sacred to be spoken out aloud as a person. In Jewish tradition, it is sometimes replaced with titles like Adonai, meaning my Lord, Jehovah. Jehovah is a Latinized form of Yahweh. It emerged when Christian scholars combined the consonants Y-H-W-H with the vowels of Adonai to create a pronounceable name. Oh yes, usage. Some Christian denominations such as Jehovah Witnesses prominently use Jehovah. It is also found in older Bible translations and some modern ones too. Mm -hmm. Both names refer to the same energy, the God or Goddess's energy within the man's name, Israel. Because Israel was originally a person, not a land. The Rothschild later funded it to become a land near Africa. This energy was central to Jewish, Christian, and Islamic traditions. This godlike energy is characterized by attributes such as omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and is worshipped as the creator and sustainer of the universe. But of course, the Romans slash Vatican's later turned it into a divine person. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why did they change Christ's energy to the name Jesus from its original Hebrew name, Yeshua? Well, it seems that the name Jesus has a fascinating history that spans several languages and cultures. Oh, yes. Here are brief origins of its origins. Hebrew roots. The name Jesus originates from the Hebrew name Yeshua, which means salvation or to save. Yeshua is a shortened form of Yehoshua or Joshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. So you're basically saying, if you didn't quite get that, save is salvation or salvation is salvation. That's literally what you're saying. So Greek translation. When the New Testament was written in Greek, Yeshua was transliterated to Isis to fit the Greek language. Yes, Isis. Latin adaptation. As Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire, the Greek Isis was adapted into Latin as Jesus. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. English evolution. The name Jesus eventually evoked into Jesus in English, influenced by the great vowel shift and other linguistic changes over time. This journey from Yeshua to Jesus reflects the spread of Christianity and the adaptation of the name across different languages and cultures. So you see, Yeshua aka Jesus means not a person but salvation and leading people to spiritual salvation. It was never a person. Joshua who Moses named to lead the Israelites, which is a state of consciousness, not a person. How does it compare to Greek god Zeus, a, aka consciousness of Zeus? It means to invoke the god of protection. 
this is the highest consciousness you can invoke. This means that this entity was able to invoke the god power of Zeus. The real Zeus, Zeus in Greek mythology. Zeus was the chief deity of ancient Greek religion, a sky and weather god, and the inspiration behind the Roman god Jupiter. He was worshipped as the creator of thunder, lightning, rain, and winds, and his traditional weapon was the thunderbolt. He was known as the father of gods and men. However, most people ignore that the majority of ancient Greeks' knowledge came from Africans. Most Greek gods were actually Hellenized versions of Kemet's African deities. All Greek historians, including Homer, Diodorus, and Herodotus, acknowledge that black Africans were the first to worship the gods, and that the Greeks simply learned from them. The Greeks assumed the Egyptian gods were the true gods. So all they did was copy what the Africans created and adapted it to their customs. Traces of that African origin can still be found in their writings. In the Iliad and Odyssey, Homer wrote that every year, Greek gods went to feast with the Ethiopians or black Africans. Furthermore, Zeus's chief title was, Ethiops, which means black. So, yes, according to the ancient Greeks, Zeus, their main god, was black. Like and subscribe for more. What, my truth seekers, did you know that you can get exclusive commercial free videos on my Patreon? I post my viral and block YouTube videos on there and more and stories that I wrote. You know, I write stories, people. Oh, yes, I post them on there. I'm gonna start doing my video diary on there pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, I need to communicate with my truth seekers, they are lifesavers. I love you all. Oh, okay, I'm supposed to be advertising my Patreon. The link is below. Zeus is typically depicted as a mature and bearded figure conveying wisdom, authority, and power. Tall and imposing. Zeus is often portrayed as a tall and imposing figure symbolizing his status as the king of the gods. Strong and muscular. Zeus is usually depicted as a strong and muscular density, reflecting his role as a god associated with power and sovereignty. Oh yes crown or wreath. Zeus is sometimes shown wearing a crown or wreath, emphasizing his royal status among the gods. Mm -hmm. Holding a thunderbolt. In many representations, Zeus is depicted holding a thunderbolt, his iconic weapon associated with his control over the sky and storms. Mm -hmm. Eagle. The eagle is a common symbol associated with Zeus, often portrayed either beside him or perched on his arm or shoulder. Oh yes. Robes or cloak. Zeus is often depicted wearing flowing robes or cloak, symbolizing his divine majesty and authority. Mm -hmm. Serene and commanding expression. Zeus is typically shown with a serene and commanding expression, embodying his role as a wise and just ruler. But get this, this Zeus was also known as Zeus Xenios, the protector of guests and strangers. Zeus was also a very evil entity who wanted to keep humanity in the dark. Mm -hmm. In one famous myth, Zeus punishes the Titan Prometheus for giving fire to humanity by chaining him to a rock and allowing an eagle to eat his liver every day. Look, so it's said that every time you say Jesus' name, Jesus, aka Hell Zeus, you're evoking the evil identity of Zeus, the identity who calls himself the father of all gods. But this only means that you invoke the god power of Zeus, which he held in the staff that he often carried. Again, the name Zeus has its roots in ancient Greek mythology and is derived from the, the Proto Indo European root do which is D-Y-E-U, which means sky or day. Zeus is known as the god of the sky, lightning, thunder, law, order. Huh. And he is the king of all gods and the ruler of Mount Olympus, meaning the power of the sky. I think one TikTok captured him in the sky. Tell me what you think. Watch the lightning storm. Tell me what you think. Is it real? No, oh, is it faked? Holy fucking shit!
In Greek mythology, Zeus is the supreme deity or power who presides over the heavens and earth, wielding his powerful thunderbolt. His name, aka the consciousness of Zeus, signifies power, majesty, and authority. Zeus didn't have his own name. They called him by his power. All of the ancient entities called themselves by their powers. Apparently, all of his children were able to invoke elements of consciousness as well. I'm sure he taught them this, okay? But again, this is why the Romans created the Christ-like consciousness named Jesus, aka Jesus, meaning hell, the evil entity, Zeus, because they praised him, who hated humanity and had no respect for women. He cheated on his wife, Hera, or Hera, with many mortal women by disguising himself to whatever they desired. Oh yes, Lo. In one case, Lo was a mortal priestess of Hera or Hera. Zeus was captivated by her beauty. Zeus pursued her and transformed her into a white heifer to protect her from Hera's wrath. However, Hera was not easily fooled and set Argus, a giant with a hundred eyes to guard Lo. Zeus eventually sent Hermes to rescue her and Lo wandered the earth until she reached Egypt where she was restored to her human form and bore Zeus' child, Epiphus. Oh, I'm still not done yet. There was another affair. Trust me, there were many. Mm -hmm. Europa. Zeus transformed himself into a beautiful white bull to seduce Europa. She climbed onto his back and he carried her across the sea to Crete. There he revealed his true form and Europa became the mother of Minos, Rhamnathes, and Sarpedon. These stories highlight Zeus' ability to transform and disguise himself to pursue his desires, often leading to significant mythological events and the birth of important figures in Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. Here's another tragic story about a victim of Zeus. Leto was a beautiful woman married to Tyndareus, king of Sparta. She was so pretty that of course Zeus spotted her from his throne up on Olympus and wanted to have his way with her. He transformed himself into a beautiful swan. Leto spotted the swan at a riverbank that she was chilling at. An eagle started to attack the swan and for protection the swan went towards Leto it not knowing that the swan was Zeus. Zeus, keeping his swan shape, mated with Leta. Leta then went home and slept with her husband. She got pregnant and surprisingly hatched two eggs. Each had two children inside. One egg contained the children of Zeus and the other the children of Tyndareus. And one of the children that she had with Zeus was named Helen, who later became known in Greek history as Helen of Sparta. Zeus believed that women were only good for certain things and not meant to rule. This belief was passed on to the Romans who created the Bible and ensured that all female goddesses' energy was erased. As a result, women became subordinate and their actions were disregarded while only men were allowed to rule. So when a pastor, priest, or demonologist tries to invoke whatever demon inside, it is seemingly mostly women because we hold the most power. Hence Zeus's wife, Hera, whom he was running from. Oh yes. It seems like the original text discusses the idea of rebuking disobedient demons or gins in the name of Jesus and referring to Zeus as a symbolic figure. It also mentions the cross as a reminder and part of a metaphorical spell to bind a destructive force that opposes Christ-like energy or consciousness. Oh yes. Mary never existed. Joseph was a person who killed his wives and married many thereafter. Mary was a story borrowed from goddess Isis, which means throne, aka Isis, who invoked the power and the goddess of the power of the sky nature, motherhood, fertility, and magic. Isis was often depicted wearing a throne-shaped headdress, symbolizing her role as a queen, because she was able to invoke the goddess Isis, the power of the sky and nature, aka the throne, the creator of all things and people. Are you starting to realize why they want to wipe out women? Hmm. Isis is said to have had a virgin birth and taught her son Horus to perform many miracles with this power. 
Christianity adopted and modified this story and later crucified it, which means to fasten to a cross in Latin and Greek, meaning to close and seal. That's what crucified means. Later in the sixth century, the Assyrians and, and Babylonians and later the Romans adopted this method to kill or punish slaves, rebels, and criminals. Today, they administer death penalty through methods such as the electric chair or lethal injection. There it is. The origin of the name Jesus is an invoked of Zeus and Zeus is a Greek mythical deity that may or may not exist. Christ is a state of consciousness. Mary was a borrowed story from goddess Isis aka the entity who held the goddess Isis consciousness known as the throne. Again, these entities were named after their gifts of consciousness and power. The church distorted the story of Joseph, a possible real person, maybe, who lived in Nazareth and may have been married to a woman named Mary, like many were named back then and now, but never had a son named Jesus or Yeshua, as claimed by the church. Joseph and Mary were used as an example of the benefits of obeying men who proclaimed themselves as speakers, voices, and leaders of their self-proclaimed God, and who altered the teachings in the Bible who asserted their superiority. Later, Amun-Ra, also known as Amun, became part of this manipulation, when in reality, the name God and Goddesses is nothing but a way to invoke a state of consciousness and higher spirituality. Hence what Joshua, Enoch, Israel, and many were trying to teach us, and me. And also remember the New Testament was later added and so was the book of Revelation by the church and their interpretations of Jesus, who may never existed. This means that the stories of trips to Egypt by Jesus and Mary were borrowed stories or just made up. I mean, think about it. Allegedly, Joseph had many kids before and after Mary. So what did they do? Leave their other kids to invoke on a hot, unsafe voyage to Egypt because some alleged voice or identity told them to? I don't think so. This story was made the heck up. I'm just saying. Oh, and don't get me started on these misinterpretations of Satan or the devil. I think I made a video about that. I'll leave that video at the end of this video. But why was the Book of Enoch so male dominated? Perhaps the original version did include many stories about women and the publisher may have removed them to favor men because he was one. I mean, I tried telling the story to my husband. He gave me no comment. He acted like he didn't care. This aspect remains a mystery, although there's a known instance of similar editing in the Bible. Well, that's it. Let me know what you all think below. On that note, don't forget to subscribe, share, and like, and hit that bell so you get notifications for when I do post my videos. See y'all later. Bye. Whew.